Hello, welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going to be looking at The Roosting Hawk. Very interesting poem, lots to get into. Just in case I haven't mentioned it for a while at the beginning of the videos, remember everything else, the structure, the images, the language, all support the meaning. And then the effect reader is just kind of like an annex at the end, the things that we actually think about. So we're always trying to think about how these help get across the different meanings and ideas, etc. Um, so we start off with the structure and we've got these quatrains that are quite rigid now they're quite rigid in terms of them all being four uh, sorry uh, four <clears throat> four line stanzas but at the same time all the line uh, lengths are different and we've also got some enjoyment going in from one to the other so although it sounds more like it's like it's trying to be um very rigid and well thought out and grandiose and powerful in that but it hasn't executed it quite well so that tells us obviously there's like an innate nature which can't quite do exactly what it wants to do and that's quite interesting because it's trying to be rigid obviously a lot of the poem is very kind of arrogant and full of itself and, and selfish or self-assured and extremely confident whichever way you want to take it but um in its in its uh, in its actual movement from stanza to stanza, it's not as um, separate as the the quatrains would would have us think. Now this is also supported by the idea of the odd rhyme. So if we look at the beginning here, we've got um, A B C C in the rhyme, and then we've got uh, D E D or partial D, etc. Uh, etc. Et so we've got like rhyme here, and we've got rhyme here, and so we're starting to build some kind of rhythm, but the rhythm is at odds with each other, and then it just kind of disappears as we go through. Now that's really interesting because it kind of points to an erratic nature. The bird, the hawk, can't actually. Um, we can see fully fledged rhyme here, so maybe it's not as in control as it thinks it, it thinks it is, and also maybe it's not as grand as it thinks it is. And again, I think that that erratic nature is is a secondary point, but I think it's still really an important point that you know it could be a really original, unique idea to 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 cut angle to actually go for if you obviously you understand the idea. Because what I'm trying to get across, or what, what I think is coming across, is that the hawk ultimately sees itself as a grand creature but through its actual actions and what it actually does and how it describes itself it's not actually as assured it comes across and we'll discuss a little later as just a little bit deluded but we'll we'll um, we'll come to that it's specifically just because of the, the the limited capacity that it actually has to understand but we'll come to a little more evidence of that in a bit so we've got the enjoyment as well in the structure which is really interesting which invites us to actually consider words that um, precede the breaks so we've got the um, falsifying dream here we've got the power of the sun's ray and we've got obviously the idea of um, the creation and holding creation in my foot so say just for example for the last one obviously you can look at any of them but so this one now I hold creation in my foot then that kind of just really lets us stop and consider the image where it holds uh, you know like you know the idea of all the world not just the creation of the branch under its foot but you know the whole world it, it thinks itself so supreme and powerful and it's all underfoot um, or in its hand obviously because it's a hawk and it doesn't have a hand it has wings but it does have a, a foot so to so to speak uh, and then we have the idea of I wanted to pick out and discuss the roosts because we've got a couple of meanings for that so it's called the roosting hawk and obviously it's the whole description here is he doesn't actually go anywhere in this he's just sitting watching all of this and just telling us about what he daydreams about so he's that's in his resting place so we understand that the roost is resting place and that's where he's comfortable to do that but then on top of that like the resting place is kind of could be referring to his place in life you know that's where he's at rest thinking like this acting like this uh, sorry thinking like this and thinking of acting like this and that's part of his his, his um, character so the roosting there could also be referring to him being comfortable with that place in life and that um, that that you can take that as a double meaning so we move on then to meaning so we've got the idea of nature obviously in terms of the hawk in what it's actually doing you know it's just kind of doing its um what it's programmed to do is just following its inbuilt nature etc and uh, we've got the idea of nature in terms of the the tree and the sun etc 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 so we get a lot of those kind of ideas coming through uh, and it, it, you know it's and it's a place devoid of humans so it's kind of very a natural nature not a nature that we create uh, with like with some parks or we sculpt or etc etc and then we've got an idea in the actual nature that we refer to in terms of human nature that means more in terms of our choices or the way we sorry not necessarily our choices the way we choose to do things and their 
their results that are, that are kind of innate within us so perhaps it is the beating of other creatures and the destruction of other creatures and the conquering of other creatures and of our own race etc and we get that mainly for the, you know this the idea of the element of death and when um, we, you know anything we take in ideas or in a primitive sense at least man has an idea that we you know take it because it's all ours you know everything's just excuse me up for grabs etc so you can look at it that way now here obviously i've pulled out the idea of war and conflict obviously because the uh, anthology's uh, brief of the title is conflict so really when you're looking for the conflict here you, the war element or the war uh, link we could say is we can imagine the hawk like an army you know taking over and having that much power and conquering etc and that works, except for apparently there's been several references I've read that Ted Hughes, the writer of this poem, actually said this wasn't about war or an oppressor or a dictator, etc., etc. It was just about nature at a given time. So although I've added it here because it's in this, the conflict we're probably looking for is more of an inner conflict. Um, but again, the war, you know, if, if it's going to be of relevance to the war, um, comparison here can, can be made and you can say oh it's a it's a reflection of human nature and you know human um, you know destruction of of other creatures etc and, and it'd be perfectly justifiable um all right so we move on to the next one uh, we've got the idea of the hawk being in its place you know being in its trees within nature and then obviously doing what naturally stems from that so again just following what it was made to do and we've also got the idea of the obviously there's a lot of arrogance um i should, I should put that in here um arrogance but also of delusion because because we don't really know missed out the air, we don't really know whether or not this is you know he, yeah Obviously, we know that the world isn't like this for them. Um, we don't really have a time reference for, for Ted Hughes. And we don't, we, he, in, from an evolutionary sense as well, we couldn't really go back you know, far enough to know whether even hawks, I don't know whether hawks were actually around before humans inhabited the Earth. So we presume this is happening at the same time that humans cohabit the Earth. And so we know that the hawk isn't the most powerful. We know that the hawk it doesn't, it, you know, the Earth isn't facing upward, looking up at, uh, you know, waiting for the hawk's inspection. We know that. That it doesn't hold all of creation in its fur. It, all these things yeah, we know. So it kind of shows the arrogance of the hawk thinking, you know, how great it is. But then obviously it's the delusion in, in, in there as well. And this harks back to the uh, the things I picked out at the beginning about the odd, excuse me, about the odd um, rhyme scheme, etc. And the, the, the lack of rigidity between the quatrains, even though they're trying to be quite rigid. It's like there's a facade of like superior power, etc. But then as we actually go through, we find there is, there is uh, this whole other thing behind him uh, this whole other thing uh, this world that you know he doesn't quite fully grasp he only kind of understands it from his own point of view um and then especially with the sun being behind him you know he from his tree hop if he looks up and sees the sun behind him then he knows that there is something greater bigger you know doing more than him so it's kind of a deluded position to hold but um it just really seems like he, he doesn't know about the rest of the world it, is all this really is so but then is that because that is again part of his nature is he limited to that or is that just because uh, this is one stupid bird? I would definitely go for the for the first one out of that. But again, there's there's lot. They're all very different. Those obviously the second, the, f the first, and the third are the same. But the other three are actually quite different ideas. So try and look at them in terms of of that. You know, which one's going to s suit the analysis that you're writing best? But they're all there for you to to add more notes to. So the images that we get there, we've got some excellent images in this one. As I just mentioned, we've got the Earth looking up. Um, and that kind of gives us the idea of you know its power. You know, it looks down on the earth and thinks the earth's looking up for looking it up for, for inspection. You know, wanting the hawk's approval, etc. <laughs> you know, there's the, the, this great earth that's underneath it. Uh, and again, that that t touches upon the the simplicity of the bird's understanding. And we can look at it that way, but also beauty. You know, just imagine looking down on it and and and, and seeing just the earth from from the position of a. Uh, from the position of a of a hawk, um, obviously a lot closer than a plane, and a lot less noisy with no screaming children. Um, looking at the second one, then we've got this violent image of the tearing heads off, and this is one of the things that a lot of people link to the uh, conflict and the idea of war because of the uh, violent imagery here, and obviously the conquering of, of of something else. So yeah, the tearing heads off is is, is clearly a reference to destruction and to, to you know to the power that it has, um, you know, justifying some of its arrogance. Then we. 
we've got the idea of the sun um, as this eye behind him, kind of watching him, um, and then his eye, yeah, then his eye, excuse me, looking around, etc. And I think that's important because he sees like maybe the sun looking in on him, and then he looks around and thinks he's in control over the earth. And it's just kind of an interesting play of power. You know, what's really got the power there? It's the sun. So this this huge delusion. You know, without the sun, he can't see. And when the sun goes, to, you know, to an extent, um, obviously Hawke's vision is brilliant. But um, you know, without the sun, he, he doesn't have you know, as we would know, like a load of things. But he still thinks he's got this this power etc etc so again it's the delusion coming through and um, I also picked out the sun behind me for the idea of the different ways in which we can see the hawk within the with the sun behind him so if the sun's behind him if you can imagine that and we look up and we see it we see this shadow which actually links to the death it brings so it's kind of like the shadow of death in the sun so as it would kind of move through uh you know just before it kills something we've also looked at the idea of its stealth in that we, you know sometimes we might lose it we won't be able to see it because obviously we'll squint etc or creatures would squint looking up at it and then obviously there's the idea of this you know this black thing moving across a yellow ball if if that is the if that is the you know we want to extend that further and it's the idea of the death danger that comes and obviously that's echoed because of the way it kills things etc um, so on to the language now it's very possessive we've got lots of personal pronouns I my me again accessing or extenuating should I say the arrogance and the personal viewpoint that's actually coming through and, and almost you could say too much so because you know we've got our one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven you see there's a lot there and so that in some way either shows a real simplicity of mind but you know because it's one to only talk about oneself and to obviously you think you're so powerful well but even though i say all this there is it's like that's the um, mentality but the capability obviously is is a lot stronger in terms of the the use of language but that is to do with the grandeur of the creature and how how um, beautiful and, and graceful uh, hawks are and powerful obviously um so all those all those personal pronouns there that are actually being used are really important to, to emphasize its own power and its own idea of itself then, as I mentioned earlier, we've got hooked, which is a lovely, a lovely word just to kind of show the aerodynamic. Um, and obviously, the hook to us is obviously known, can be quite a, a sharp weapon, um, yeah, especially when used to pierce something or hold something up, sort of like slabs of meat, etc. So we can see it as quite dangerous. And obviously, that being repeated as well, that's really powerful because it kind of shows that this whole creature is like designed to kill. It's not, it's not just like one part of it that it will use to kill. And then we've got the word uh, creation. And uh, I like this because, you know, you've got the, the whole of creation to produce my foot and now I hold it. So very quickly in the idea of the kind of the hawk being some kind of um, evolutionary marvel, which it is, and then uh, second of all that now he be kind of becomes superior than the evolutionary marvel, uh, yeah, then in every, sorry, than the things that made him, so you know, he kind of outgrows his station. So we kind of watch him grow and then him outgrow what he grew from, which is just a really nice, uh, you know, use, using it twice just kind of sets up a really nice image image for us. And also because um, my whole creation in my foot it could be a reference to the fact that he, the, the hawks generally when they're adults do, don't really have any natural, well, the big ones anyway, don't have any natural predators. So we look then at the effect on the reader. Well, it makes us think about our place in the world. You know, who who are we? What, what do we do? What's our nature? Well, what are we supposed to do? How do we try and present ourselves? Um, look, it helps us think as well about why do we do what it is we do? Um, and obviously this is more of an interesting reference to things like war, etc. And uh, the actual developments or the steps that lead to war and whether we get involved or whether we don't get involved, etc. And just generally, you know, why we do what we do, what we do is innate in our nature, you know, this really interesting nature, no, well, sorry, it's this really done to death nature, nurture debate and um, the, the extensions that come from, from that. And then I think this... And I, I, this is a, it's not a cop out one. I really do think this is like when you looked at this and you think about it in this the midst of this anthology, it is quite stand out. It is quite surprising. So it's really got me thinking about the nature of poems. Obviously, looking at it from such a different point of view from that of a hawk. First of all, it, perhaps you know giving the, a voice to an animal, a voice to another. 
Another object isn't isn't uh, sorry. Another creature or object isn't that surprising, but just the way that this can be taken, in looking at so so many different ways, whether you're going to compare it to to wall or whether it's more about um, arrogance or whether it's more about just you know the the nature and the things in their place in nature. I think it just gets to think about the nature of poems and how 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 brilliant uh, it is to just get to analyze them and, and really just di dissect them. Um, and that that is worth mentioning because obviously, like life. There are so many little facets and elements, etc., to actually look at, and I think that's one of the most uh, powerful things about about this this poem. Hope that was useful.